If you look at where Pennsylvania is on Google Maps, something that immediately becomes noticeable is this river here. This is the Susquehanna River, and if you look at where it comes in contact with the Appalachian Mountains, it seems to defy logic. I mean, rivers flow from high to low ground, right? So how is it possible that this river completely cut through the mountains without having its path diverted at all? If we were to investigate any other river, such as the Hudson River here, you can see that the river very much flows from high to low ground. It starts as a small stream up in the mountains, and it goes along its course slowly to lower ground until eventually it is in the Hudson Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, right? So how is it possible that the Susquehanna River here completely cuts through the mountains instead of meandering around them? Well, there are actually two different models that scientists have proposed. The first one is called an antecedent river. Essentially, an antecedent river is a river that was present on the landscape before the topography was there. And this is true with the Susquehanna River, where the river is said to be around 320 to 340 million years old, one of the oldest rivers in North America and the world. And so this river was here before this part of the Appalachian Mountains existed. And thus, when the Appalachians did form during the Allegheny Orogeny, the river was able to erode the mountains that were raising up quicker than they were able to form because a mountain building process is an extremely slow process. And this leaves you with the seemingly impossible cut through the mountains that we can see today. However, today, an antecedent river isn't actually the main explanation for why the Susquehanna River is how it is. The model that scientists now say is true is a superimposed river. So what a superimposed river is, is a river that originally formed on flat land, which the Susquehanna River did. The area where it formed was actually a plateau that had underlying faults from before that had been eroded away. So the Susquehanna River used to be in a valley that eroded away multiple layers of sedimentary rock. And then the geological uplift occurred. And when the uplift happened, it raised the edges higher. And this is because the Susquehanna River had already eroded away layers of sedimentary rock, while on the outside of the Susquehanna River, it hadn't. And so this allowed the edges of the river to be higher than the river course itself. And this is the commonly accepted theory for how the Susquehanna River seemingly cuts through the landscape. So in today's video, let's examine multiple antecedent and superimposed rivers in our world. The next river we are going to look at is the Colorado River in Arizona. So as you probably know, the Colorado River forms the Grand Canyon. And the Grand Canyon was actually formed with a combination of the river being superimposed and the river being antecedent. So essentially, the Colorado River existed before the Colorado Plateau existed in this area. And of course, this caused the river to be superimposed on the landscape. So it had already eroded away layers of rocks so that when the Colorado Plateau formed, it was already in that position and the edges grew higher than where it is today. And so that partially explains the Grand Canyon today where the edges would have been higher than the river itself but the river also has eroded away a lot of the landscape as well. And this has deepened and widened the Grand Canyon to where it is today. And so turning on the terrain map mode of Google Maps, I love the terrain map mode, it's so interesting to see. It's just crazy to see how this river cuts straight through the plateau and seems like it just completely ignores it. An example of a river that is purely antecedent is the Meuse in France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. The Meuse begins in Plateau de Langres in France and then flows north through France, eventually reaching a hillier mountainous area known as the Ardennes. And when it gets here, it completely cuts through the landscape. And again, this is from the river being antecedent. So as the Ardennes were rising in this area, the Meuse eroded away the rock that was rising and maintained its original course. There is one more region we are going to be looking at, and I would call it the area where the most antecedent rivers on the planet are, or at least the best examples of antecedent rivers are, and these are the Himalayan mountains. Many of the rivers that flow south into the Arabian Sea or Bay of Bengal 
do not flow from the Himalayans on the side you'd expect them to, on the south side of the Himalayans, although some of them do, but there are multiple rivers that form in the Tibetan area north of the main Himalayan range, and then flow south into the Indian Ocean. So one example is the Indus River over here, and let's just follow the course of the Indus River here. So as we're following it, you will notice that obviously it cuts through the Himalayan mountains. And again, this is because the river is antecedent. The Himalayan mountains are actually pretty young in terms of mountains. And so the rivers here had a lot of time to remain in this area. And as we're traveling along, multiple different rivers that are also antecedent flow into it. This used to be a pretty complex river system with a bunch of tributaries, and it still is, but now these tributaries cut through the Himalayan mountains because they were here before the Himalayan mountains were. Now the source of the Indus River is disputed, but it's typically said to be this pond area here named Sangha Zhangbo. I definitely pronounced that wrong. But as you can see on here, it really looks like it continues beyond that. But this is the traditional source. Now, very interestingly, you only have to go around 150-ish miles, which I know 150 miles is a lot, but it's very short if you consider the global scale. So you only have to go 150 miles away to find the source of our next river. And this is the Yarlung Sangpo River. Now, where does this Yarlung Sangpo River flow to? Well, let's just follow its course. And while we're following its course, I will be telling you interesting facts about the Yarlung Sangpo. So the Yarlung Sangpo is said to have formed around the early Oligocene era, which is around 40 million years ago. And then the Himalayas rose, and so this creates the antecedent river that we see today. And something very interesting as this process was happening is that the river actually did get affected by the Himalayan mountains. You see, it is hypothesized that the river used to flow westward instead of eastwards, but as the Himalayan mountains were rising, it changed the direction of the flow to flow eastward instead. But we keep following this river, and then it reaches this area of extremely high terrain here. And in this area, it forms what is known as the Yarung Sangpo Grand Canyon. This is another Grand Canyon on Earth. And this Grand Canyon is actually said to be deeper and longer than the Grand Canyon in North America. It has an average depth of around 16,000 feet and a maximum depth of around 19,000 feet, and it is also 313 miles long. And looking at this place on a map does not bring it justice, so let's look at some images. I mean, this canyon is so secluded, yet this would be such a beautiful place to visit. I mean, look at how high the mountains that it surround it are. And a lot of these areas probably are the more accessible parts. They're probably not the deepest parts. It's just so crazy to see how this looks. I mean, look at some of these images. I would love to visit here. This would be beautiful. And I just found this photosphere, and this might be one of the most beautiful photospheres I've ever seen on Google. I could make an entire video talking about the Yarlung Sangpo River and its Grand Canyon and the story around it. If you'd like to see that, leave a comment. But let's continue down this river's path and see where it ultimately ends up. So it flows south here, and eventually it turns into the Brahmaputra River. And as you probably know, if you've seen my past videos, I've somehow mentioned the Brahmaputra River three different times in my videos. This Brahmaputra River eventually flows south all the way to the Bay of Bengal. So it is actually insane how this river flows. It flows all the way from here north of the Himalayas to south of the Himalayas in Bangladesh. But that is all the superimposed and antecedent rivers I'm going to be looking at in today's video. If you have an interesting video suggestion, please leave them in the comments below. And I hope I was able to teach you something. See you in the next one.